Welcome to episode five of Full House Rewind, also known as Sea Cruise. I'm your host, Dave Coulier. Mike Binder is our guest on the show today, and well, he's going to be joining us very shortly. Of course, every episode has a director. During the shoot for Full House episode five, we went to lunch that day, and after lunch, we couldn't find our director. So it was explained to us that he was tired and fell asleep. Hmm? Yeah. But then when he returned to the set, he was really sweaty, and I couldn't stop making jokes about his sweatiness to the entire crew. Now back to episode five, Sea Cruise. The show opens with the girls dressed up as honeybees. The guys go fishing with Jesse's ex-girlfriend, Roxana, and her backup singers. There's some possible romance with Danny and Captain Caroline, and the guys sing Rock and Robin and the theme from Love Boat. Well, then Danny goes overboard, followed by Joey and Jesse, who jump in to save him. Later on, the girls come over to the house for a fish dinner, and things don't go so well with Roxana and Jesse and Caroline and Danny. Joey intervenes and talks to the guys in the kitchen. Danny shares a moment about how much he misses his wife, Pam, and the guys hug in the kitchen. Jesse and Danny work things out with Roxana and Caroline. DJ and Stephanie return home from Honeybees, and the episode closes with Jesse giving one more hug to Stephanie. We'd like to hear what you think about episode five, so send us an email at fullhouserewind at podco.us. And with that, let's get on with the show. Oh. Somebody's at the door. Hi, Dave. Hey, Comet. What's going on? I like this episode where the girls are dressed up like honeybees. Yeah, me too. The girls look so cute in those bee costumes. I don't think bees are cute. I tried to eat a bee once. You did? Yep. It hurt. That was the day I laid in the bushes and wouldn't come out, remember? I do remember that day. Me too. I'm never going near those yellow flowers again. I hope not. You gotta be careful. <laughs> I see what you did there. You're a funny comedian, Dave. Thank you, Comet. <laughs> well, I'm probably gonna stop by every day. Love you, Dave. I love you too, Comet. <laughs> You've got messages. Oh, let's check the answering machine. Hey, Dave, it's me, SpongeBob. I love Full House Rewind. Especially this episode, Sea Cruise. Yeah, me too. Were those real fish you caught, Dave? Yeah, they look like a couple of our friends. Please tell me they were just props. Like props on a boat motor? Patrick? Yes, SpongeBob? Sometimes I think you need to go back to school. Like a school of fish? <laughs> Patrick? That was supposed to be my joke. Oh, sorry. Patrick, next time I have a joke, you have to remember that... You're going to love our special guest, Mike Binder. Have you ever met someone and you just know that you're going to be best friends with them for life? Now, as I mentioned earlier in the show, our director for Full House Episode 5 showed up sweaty after lunch. I can guarantee you that Mike Binder has never showed up sweaty after lunch on one of the many, many television shows and movies that he's written, produced, and directed. I met Mike when I was opening for him at the Comedy Castle in Detroit when I was an 18-year-old stand-up comic. After the show, Mike was kind enough to talk to me about comedy in Los Angeles and convinced me to move out there in 1979. We were roommates for several years, living in Westwood, California, and I watched Mike write his first movie, Crossing the Bridge, at our kitchen table. He went on to write and produce several films, including Indian Summer, The Upside of Anger, starring Kevin Costner, and he created and starred in his own series for HBO called The Mind of the Married Man. He's currently back doing stand-up comedy everywhere. You can check out everything he's up to at standupworld.com. He's also from our hometown of Detroit, and I love him dearly. Here's what Mike looked like when Full House was on the air. Please welcome my good buddy, Mike Binder. Hey, Dave. How you doing? Good to be here, man. So, uh, Congratulations. Thank, well, thank you. Th I'm, I'm turning my age. Is that what I'm... No, no. <laughs> I, I'm having this great show. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, I know. It's I a really, fun show. I, I think it's great, and, and I, I think 
you're the perfect guy to do it. And I, I know so many people that love Full House. This is the perfect. This is this is great. It's fun. This we're having a yeah. we're we're having a blast. I just saw you. Um, we're we're old friends, by the way. We will we'll get into all the stories, but. I just saw Mike. I just saw you in Detroit. You were opening for Adam Sandler at Little Caesars Arena. That's right. In front of, I don't know, 17,000 people. 18,000. 18,000. I'm sorry I got that wrong. 18,000 people. Yeah, and I got to Mel hang were out. there and we were great. My wife Mel came with me. We hung out with Kevin James and Rob Schneider and you. And uh, you had a great set. You're back yeah. doing stand up, which is, I'm so happy to see you back doing stand up because. We started as stand-ups, yep. and then you know you started writing and directing and producing your movies and television shows, and you got away from it for a long time. Twenty-eight years. Twenty-eight years, and I I don't know that I could take twenty-eight years off of stand-up and this just with reckless abandon like you've done, jump back up on the stage. It's yeah. it's pretty. It's a ballsy move. I mean, it's and, amazing, and I, and I love it. And, yeah, I, and I, I never tell. planned on doing it again, ever. And I, I have to say, I love it more than when I used to do it. I'm better at it than I did, I was. And um, I actually credit Mark Marin because he kept asking me to be on his podcast, and I did. He went, I want to talk about the comedy story, the early days, and I was, it was so far gone to me. I said, I don't really want to talk about that. Right. And then I had this novel come out, Keep Calm, that I was going to do a movie at New Line. And I said, I, I'll talk about that. He said, but we're going to talk about the comedy store. Right. And we did. And then they called me to do the documentary on the comedy store, which I thought immediately thought, okay, yeah, I'll do that. That's a good idea. Yeah. I know Because I know the real stories will be real. We were there funny. for a lot of we them. We were there for yeah. so many of them. And I worked on it for two and a half years. And like people kept saying, do you miss it? Do you miss it? I went, nope, nope, not at all, not at all. I, it was another part of my life. And one night, Felicia Michaels asked me to jump up in the belly room and do a 15-minute set for this special show she was doing about older guys, yeah. older people. She played she played uh, a girlfriend of mine on Full House. Wow, yeah, that's great. Yeah, She's great. Yeah. But I said yes. And I hadn't been on stage in 20 some years. And then it kept getting closer and closer. And I thought, wow, I, she put out ads and everything. And I'm not, I'm going to have to do this. So I'll have to write new material because nothing from, you know, being 20. <laughs> a day at yeah, Disneyland. None, yeah. Or Bill Clinton's a weirdo, <laughs> you know. So I wrote a new 15 minutes. Yeah, and I went up, and it worked. Yeah, which the is first tough. Night, it, which is tough it, to do it, it right out amazing. of the gate. Yeah. And it worked. And then you got hooked. Didn't I, you? It was like doing heroin. <laughs> it was like doing heroin. I'm in the alley begging guys for time spots. You know. Yeah. And and I just you kids it. at home who are watching uh, that the thing Mike just talked about. That's like eating a lot of chocolate. That's right. Just so you know. That's right. right. Okay. And um, and but I loved it. And plus, I'd been around, you know, I directed, at that point, I directed a bunch of Netflix specials, Bill Burr right, specials, right. And, and a bunch Didn't of- Didn't you direct his Red Rocks? Uh, Red Rocks, his Red Paper Rock special. Tiger special, right, a few. Right. I've directed a bunch of stand-up you know. specials. Yeah. And I knew so many of the, the guys, and I just got back into it in a different light in a, after writing, we should, am I talking too much about this? No, we're editing you down to three minutes. Okay, good. So, right, uh, so this will call. So, but anyway, I just love it. And being there in Detroit, by the way, with you and Mel, and you, and Mel was taking video and taking pictures yeah. and doing her thing, and and um, and it was just great. And I knew, and I knew that Sandler really got a kick out of being with you in the dressing room. And later, he told me that you know he said it was really great to be with Dave and talk with. Him. You know, because well, we're from the old school, yeah. you know, from the yeah. Sandy, Sandy Wernick, Brad Gray, and Bernie yeah. Brill's team. You guys era. were doing impressions of all the, the. Yeah, and we talked to Sandy on yeah. the phone. He called, remember? Oh, that, no, yeah. I wasn't yeah. in the room at that yeah, point. He called. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was somewhere doing laughing gas or something, just getting ready. To, <laughs> I was nervous. I was nervous. You were nervous. You were nervous. And, 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 and you know what? I, I don't care what level of stand up you reach 
when you're going out for an important big show, you're nervous. Yeah. And, it, and it's not so much nerves as it is adrenaline. You know, you're yeah. just, you're so pumped to get to that microphone. And if you're anything like, like me, you're, you're nervous until you get to that mic. And then you get to the mic and everything kind of goes, ah, I'm back home. Well, I, one of the things was Sandler and Kevin James and I were having lunch and he, Kept going, look at you. You're nervous. You're nervous. Was, <laughs> Should I be nervous? He keeps telling me I'm nervous. Right. I and remember. then right as Rob Schneider was going on right before me, I had this pit in my stomach. I went, oh, man, I'm so nervous. There's 18,000 people here that, you know. Yeah. And, and truthfully, I just started praying. I just said, hey, you know, God, just take these nerves away because I don't need them right now. You know, I know I'm. I, I got the goods, you know, and I, right. I had gone to Mark Ridley's club and the Comedy Castle the night before, and I'd gone to Detroit. Uh, I, fit with, I forget what they call the club downtown, the brand new La Detroit Laughs, mm -hmm. you know, the new one downtown, and I'd worked out the set. Yeah. And I, I knew it was going to work. Yeah. You know, and you did great. Yeah. You it, did great. You know, I was there watching the whole set. But uh, I was really nervous, and, and I don't really get that nervous anymore, you know? I was standing there with, with Adam Sandler and uh, Kevin James, and the three of us were all standing there, and, and uh, we all looked at each other at one point and we went, he's doing okay, he's doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I got a great yeah. picture of you guys. Yeah. Um, we go back, let's go back all the way back. You know, I want to take everybody who's watching and listening through through our journey together because uh, we first met 1979 and you were already a big deal by then. To me, I was an 18 year old stand up comic in Detroit. You were coming to Detroit to headline at the Comedy Castle. And it's I, the first week of the Comedy Castle. Yeah, right? and you were a big headliner. You had already done a Norman Lear pilot called Apple Pie. You'd been on Make Me Laugh. You'd been on The Tonight Show? Uh, you, you were a big deal. And, and so uh, I was really nervous, you know, and, and so you were headlining and it was packed. I mean, everybody who knew Mike Binder in Detroit was there at that show. Your family was there, friends, you know, and, and I was really nervous. And so I'd only kind of been working locally in Detroit. I really hadn't ventured out anywhere to even any other cities or anything. And I opened for you and I did really well. Yeah. I, I did really well, and I and I thought, wait a second, I'm doing. I shouldn't be doing this well on stage right now. I, the show's supposed to go. Was like that this. was the first time you opened for me? Was the time the that first you, time it was like it's hard. I was having trouble following you. It was that. It was that time. It was that yeah, time? That's the time I'm talking. I, I about. remember one time. I, I didn't know it was the first time. I remember that was the first the time. First I opened time. For I remember. You. I'm having trouble following this guy. This guy is so good. I can't. He, he's killing, and, and you had that. You had a likability that I've only seen you and maybe one or two other guys, you and Michael Keaton, just natural likability that the audience just loved you. And you're right. The show does have to go a certain way. And yeah. you, I think you also went a little long. <laughs> <laughs> but but you killed. I didn't, know, I didn't realize it was the very first night. That was the very first it time. It was the very first time. Because I hadn't met you, and I thought, this guy is going to think I'm the biggest idiot for you know going up and trying to upstage him or whatever no, but i was I just doing my same set that no, i'd been I doing didn't think you, you know no, i didn't think but here's what happened uh you came through the curtain as i was exiting the stage and you said don't go anywhere i want to talk to you afterwards and then you went up and you did your set and you you made fun of me for about the first five minutes you said i didn't think i was going to get upstage by a kid with braces <laughs> on his teeth and uh and so i watched your set and um, I waited for you. And then we sat in a booth at the Comedy Castle. And it was the greatest thing for me at that point in my life because here was a guy who was my same age, a young comic who had been to LA and was living in LA and was on television talking to me like I was a peer. Yeah. And I love that. That gave me such a boost where it, you said, you need to come to LA. And that was when I decided, okay, I'm gonna move to LA. Yeah, and we were roommates for how many, like we seven were, years, right? We, we were roommates for far too long. Yeah, far too uh, long. <laughs> <laughs> but but during those early days, your dad was my biggest champion. Yeah, my dad loved you. Yeah. Your dad, Bert, 
Bert Binder was so kind and he would pull me aside and, and he would say, Dave, you're so likable up there and you're funny. You're going to be a big star. Yeah. And I thought, ah, this is just Mike's dad talking. What does he know? You know? Okay. But he was always so kind and yeah, he so would, positive. You no, know, because he would say to me, he'd say, don't lose your driver's license because you're going to end up delivering pizzas. <laughs> okay, it, it ain't gonna go well for eating you. a lot of pizzas. <laughs> I think he meant. it's not gonna go well for you, Mike. But your buddy Dave, he loved you. But but seriously, that I remember that night, man. You you were so good, and no, it it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me because I knew how good you were. I I, I thought this guy's gonna make it big, you know. And and I I thought it was great. I thought uh, you know I I. I, f I knew we were going to be friends our whole lives, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you were the best man at my wedding. Oh, I know, I know. I, you know, in, in your intro that you didn't hear, I talk about that. Like, have you met, you ever meet somebody and you just know you're going to be best friends with them the rest of your life? And it's and it's been true, you know? Right. And, and uh, after Detroit then, I decide I'm going to move out to Los Angeles at 19 years old, still have braces on my teeth. I remember and that. I... I go to audition at the comedy store and uh, I was living at UCLA in one of the dorms. I was renting a dorm room there, had no car, but you said, when you come to audition, I'm going to help you. So Monday night at the comedy store, Sunset Boulevard, I get my slot and they misspelt my name or whatever it With was. With a W or something. Yeah, it was like Dave Detroit or something, yeah. you know. And uh, I think it was Robert Aguayo was the host. And you sat during my whole set next to Mitzi Shore. And I guess people were coming up to her and you're like, no, Mitzi, watch this kid. Watch this kid, right? Well, you know, you had to do that. If you knew Mitzi you knew, and you had a friend that was auditioning, you knew your job was to goaltend. Yeah. You know? Right. And everybody knew that, I, you know. Keep her focused. On, you, you, yeah. If you had a buddy auditioning, your job was to go, hey, 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 out. She's watching somebody right now. Right. And that, because if not, guys would come up in, in the middle of, of a guy's set. And, and I was terrified because there was a picture of uh, Eddie Shore. Was it Eddie? No, Sammy Ed Shore. No, no, it was Eddie, Eddie Fisher. Eddie, Eddie Fisher. Eddie, um, Eddie Fisher. The light. Yeah, the light. Uh, it wasn't was Eddie, Eddie Fisher. Ed, yeah, yeah. It was um, it, Eddie Cantor. Eddie Cantor. I'm sorry. It was Eddie right, Cantor? Right, yeah. And it was a picture of Eddie Cantor, and the light would pop up on. And I never got the light, and I thought, uh oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm already past my time on stage. I know I am, but I don't think she turned the light on. I think she must have said, "Let him go. Let yeah, him go." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You and were doing great. Up, and I ended up doing like 20 minutes, which was a long set for a monday night and then i came over and you were sitting there and she said oh dave i want you to be a regular and that was huge i remember i called my friends and family i called my friend cinder i said you're not gonna believe it i'm a regular at the comedy store well and that was know, a huge you know, that listen, was a huge thing that, that you did same thing happened to me although i didn't have any but a friend there i just went up the first time ever and killed uh -huh. and i had never killed before like I'd, straight from Detroit? Straight like from this? Detroit. Wow. And I've been playing little clubs in Detroit and Ann Arbor. So you were 18, 19? I was 18, yeah. 18. And I just went up there and I had ripped my my suit, my suit pants. I was wearing a suit for some reason because <laughs> I thought that's what comedians did. I was so young. <laughs> He's jumped a over, young Robert Klein, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, and yeah. I had jumped over to the fence and ripped my the, the whole knee wide open. And I, <laughs> when I went up on stage and I killed on a Monday night in Westwood, had the room, and she just came over to me at the end. She goes, you're great. I want you to be a regular. And, and she said, do, what, do you have a job? I go, no. She goes, I work the door. She goes, but I don't like the rip suit thing. That, if, that's a, <laughs> if that's your hook, get rid of it. She thought that that was going to be, right. I, that was like my thing. Right. So that was rare. And then the, for the both of us, to yeah. have it. but you didn't, you didn't, and then when I went back to do the Comedy Store documentary years later, 28 years later, something like, no, I don't know how many years, but I would interview these doormen and stuff that, who were there for 
eight years and hadn't been made a regular yet. If I didn't, <laughs> yeah. if I hadn't been made a regular in six months, I'd have split. <laughs> yeah, I would have yeah. been back working at Chrysler. Or I, or I'd yeah. have gone and figured out another way in the door. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I just, in, in, you know, I just wouldn't have waited eight years to be a regular. And you know, you think back to that time. Our group of comedians were incredible you know I, I wrote some some of the names here robin williams bob saget gary shandling howie mandel uh, jim howie Carey. mandel jim carrey Whoopi goldberg roseanne yep. leno letterman dana well, carvey well, the, well leno and letterman were like the great above us they were with jimmy walker you know because jimmy, yeah. jimmy was jimmy on walker. television george carlin you know, but when those guys walked in, it was like they were walking on water. It was yeah. pretty yeah. amazing. Dennis but, Miller, Louis Anderson. But I mean, we were, yeah, that's what's more our class. <clears throat> Dennis yeah. Miller, Louis, Jim Carrey, Howie, yeah, uh, Shandling, yeah. Dennis, o- Dennis opened for me in Pittsburgh. Me too. Pittsburgh Comedy Club. Well, the, he was the, so funny. Dennis opened for me before. <clears throat> he started with me at the at the Cleveland Comedy Club. Yeah, and he yeah. Was, he was a prop comic. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember. And then um and then of course I move out to LA and I needed an apartment and you were moving out of your apartment. I think you were getting thrown out of your, your apartment. I was. And but uh, I will just say something. You were so good, so fast. You had an amazing likability. Really, you and Michael Keaton and there was a few other people that I've I, seen. I paid Mike to say all of this stuff. No, no, so. no, no, no. The check cleared. No, no. There's, you know, there's this comic working right now named Rosebud Baker. Do you know her, Rosebud? Mm-mm. She reminds me of you guys. She she has that like like ability, and I always, mm-hmm. whenever I see her, I think she reminds me of you guys. But but you right from the get go, and then I remember it's funny being here today. I remember you got this little talk show called Out of Control, a Nickelodeon. I, yeah, 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 but. It was this talk show, and um, again, we we had a we had a sixteen hundred dollar a month apartment in Westwood, and this was a a little show in a strip mall at a studio in a strip mall way out in the valley in Van Nuys, like next next to a, a donut shop, and, a, <laughs> and, and, and yeah. but but it, but and it kind of reminds me of this vibe. I mean, it, it just was back then. It was and. It, and you were so good on it, right? You, you couldn't have been more than nineteen. No, I was. I was twenty-three. You were. I was twenty-three. Okay, yeah. because I. Well, you were so immature then. I did. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were. You I were, was really immature you, for my age. You were really I immature. Was really immature. Because you were twenty-three when yeah, you. Yeah, because I did Out of Control, and then I turned twenty-four, and I did my first Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Wow. Yeah, but that was I was 20, 23 wow. okay. years old. Okay, well, I take it all back. You you yeah. you weren't that good. <laughs> you know, if, it's, if you were 20 right, Give me the money back then. <laughs> God. Give me the damn. Money. Well, and, and No, then, I didn't really I, Okay, well, anyway, that was the first thing you did. Right. And, and, but you got that you picked that up so fast, you know? You know, I had hosted a couple of local shows in Detroit, Kelly and Company, so I had kind of cut my that. teeth yeah, yeah. hosting little local programs, you know, and then there was a uh, a show in Cincinnati, the Bob something. Bob Braun. Bob Braun, yeah. And yeah. he asked me to come in and host one week. And he was a guy, he would he would have props under his desk. Remember, you have products. And he'd go, you know, Mike, uh, you're funny. And when I think of fun, I think of picnics. And when I think of picnics, I think of cons wieners. Well, it's so funny and he you would say hold the that because I was talking yeah. about him not long ago because the podcast that everyone's doing now remind me of what I used to see Bob Braun do. Yeah. Because, you know, every now and then you see on a, a podcast with a guy and he goes, hey, you know, the, the if you look men's shorts and they're not fitting right, you right. know. Yeah. Oh, that was him. But yeah. he had all these, pro- you know, all the products were under his desk and he would just do these outrageous segues, you know. Yeah. But, he, but he was great. He was gr- a great local guy. Right around that time when I first got to L.A., I lived at UCLA. I went home and I packed up all my stuff, moved back out. And yeah. then we lived at Crest Hill. That's right. And I lived, I had a place at UCLA too, not far from you. And I got thrown out of that one. That's right. <laughs> but we lived at the famous Crest Hill house up yeah, above that's the right. comedy that's store. Right. And we lived there with Argus Hamilton. And he had this assistant named Jack Leon Packer who stole, who stole all, all my clothes. clothes. Yeah, I remember right? that. And then, and then he took my clothes. And Bill and then, Hicks moved in and took my room. And Tom Wilson f- took your room. 
Yep. And uh, there was a guy named John Medley who was like a yeah. commercial actor who lived there. Yeah. And all these crazy comics would come over late at night. Everybody would come up there and, and party and I could never sleep. And and um, but I but I remember, you know, we we lived up there and Jack Leon Packer stole all my clothes. And I go to the Westwood Comedy Store one night and he's wearing my shirt. And I said, hey, where'd you get? my shirt and he goes that's not your shirt that's mine i go no now i figured out who just stole all my clothes you're wearing my shirt so i made him give my shirt back and then he gave all my clothes back but it, it, i'm like and by the way dave you've never let that go i never have I, and, I, and I, that's I, why i'm immature okay it, it, that's it why i'm immature that's why you act like right you're 19 <laughs> even though even though you're <laughs> so but because seriously you got to let that go. I really do. Yeah, that story comes up way too often. I'm, I'm immature. I know. I go to therapy for that too. And then we moved from we moved from Crest Hill to Westwood. We had a great apartment in Westwood. Yeah. Westwood. We were like Oscar and Felix from The Odd Couple because I had my room was all you know I had pictures on the wall and it was always neat. I was upstairs and Mike had a dresser with no clothes in it, so he would go to the dry cleaners and he would put all of his laundry on the floor in little stacks right yeah i didn't even have a match i just had a mattress i didn't even have a bed i got to see you though write your first movie at our kitchen table was yeah. it tales of the war wagon yeah it, it 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 ended up becoming crossing the bridge right which was a touchstone film but you would sit at our kitchen table late at night and i remember the first time i walked out i said what are you writing you said i'm, I'm writing a movie and I thought, ooh, that's pretty cool. And you, at that time, you, it, I think the working title was Tales of the Yes, Warway. it was. It was. Yeah. yeah. And you wrote that movie, and it became Crossing the Bridge, and you produced a movie. I directed it. I directed it. No, Bobby. Oh, I th oh okay. I directed yeah, that's it. Bobby, right. Bobby Newmeyer. Uh, right. And you directed Jeff Silver that movie. Di produced yeah. it. Yeah. That was a great guy, movie. Yeah, it was. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it was It was, it was touchstone film. Right. And um, the guys that did Sex, Lies, and Videotape did it. It was amazing, because... I thought it was myself. Stephen Baldwin and Josh Charles and and David Schwimmer and all and all these people's first movies. Yeah, yeah. And I just thought that was so incredible that at that point in my life it clicked. You know, you can just take a piece of paper and you can you can write something that becomes something that ends up on the screen and people go to. That was an amazing being able to watch. Well, I didn't say people went that. to it. Nobody went to it. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, yeah. nobody went not, to it. But not, I mean, you, 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 but you it's were an doing great. Process. If you could, <laughs> yeah. if you could go to that. I didn't. Movie. I didn't. We didn't. We don't want to go that far. Do you, do you remember that I was a big runner back then? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, you and, taught me how to run. And yeah. I uh, uh, forced I, me to run. I, well, I didn't force you to run, <laughs> but one. I'll tell the story. So I used to run around UCLA twice, which was eight miles. Yeah. And I loved running back then. And so, one day I'm running. And you come out and you said, hey, I'm going to go with you. I said, okay. And so I start stretching and doing all this stuff. And you're like, why are you doing that? And I was like, because I'm stretching my muscles out. And I remember you ran. You were a smoker back then. Yep. And uh, you ran about 50 yards and you started choking. And you <laughs> sat down on the curb. You sat down on the curb and I thought, uh-oh, I've just killed my roommate. That's really funny. And, but, but. You started running after that, and then I remember you'd go by yourself, and then you said, hey, I'm going to go around UCLA with you. And we went all the way around one time around UCLA, but then you became a big runner. Yeah. That was yeah. pretty, that was pretty no, cool. Yeah, we used to run the whole thing. Yeah. We used to run the, the whole eight-mile thing. Yeah. And, and uh, then I remember the other time, I remember we used to listen to Quadrophenia. And, that, we, and that, we'd run that whole thing, yeah. listen to the Quadrophenia. That was my favorite album. Yeah. Still one of my favorite yeah. albums, The Who's Quadrophenia. Yeah. Amazing. Let's get to, to Full House because you were there at the I, very, very, very Oh, I was on the beginning. plane with you when you read this pilot script. We were on a flight from Detroit coming back to L.A. I had gotten the script for Full House, and I read it on the plane. I hadn't read it yet. So I read it on the plane, and uh, I give it to you, and I said, hey, Mike, I got to go in for this audition. And I, I gave it to you. You read it. And you said, you know, Dave, I'll bet you you get this. And I'll bet it goes for eight years. Well, and also, don't forget, I was really tight with Steve Gutenberg, mm -hmm. who had done Three Men and a Baby. Right. And I thought, that thing was such a huge hit. 
Right. And this had the same kind of vibe, the yeah. populist kind of comedy. Yeah, and, three guys raising three little girls. You know, yeah. and I thought, you know, Dave, this thing's going to be a hit, and you, it's going to run for years. I'm and pretty gonna, sure you said this could I, run for eight years. That's what I said. Yeah. We were sitting on this plane. Yeah. Coming back from, and I said, and you're going to get this. And then. It's so weird. I'm best man at your wedding. Yeah. And, and you have to leave. I have to leave the day of your wedding because I'm going to shoot the full house pilot. That's right. Pretty crazy. And Bob is there and he stays because he's yeah. not in the pilot. Because he was still doing the CBS morning program That's right. in New York. No, no, he'd been fired. And, and Jeff Franklin hadn't uh, hadn't uh, hired Bob yet. Because then John and I, yeah. John Stamos and I, we did a screen test with Bob. And yeah, no, we had to reshoot well, by everything. By the time you shot the pilot, Bob had already been fired. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I thought he was. I thought he had come in for your wedding from New York where they were shooting the CBS morning, morning program. No, no, he'd been fired. He was bummed. <laughs> we were close to Bob, both oh, of us. Like fuck, extremely, yeah. extremely close. We sent, We We spent... So much time together, especially in the early. But you left. Days. I remember. I never forget that man. You left, and I don't know why, Dave. I just, I knew Full House was going to be a big hit for you. I just isn't that crazy? Am, am I? I'm right though, right? Yeah, you just had a. Yeah, it became a big hit. But no, no, <laughs> no. I just, I just always just. I knew it. I, I, you had a gut feeling. You I, know, I just I, said that. I, I didn't. I, yeah, no, I honestly, know you didn't, didn't, but because you, because it's one of those things where you don't want to. But man, I remember some of the early tapings. Man, it, it just you guys were so good together, you know. Yeah, it was a chemistry that you can't, you can't really, you know, calculate that. Here's you the other thing I remember. You know. By the way, here's the other thing I remember. I remember they put you on Friday nights. Yeah, and I remember thinking, that's good, because back then. Friday night, you didn't there was have, nothing else on. There was Friday. nothing else on, and you. It wasn't like, like Thursday night was the big competition night. Yeah, and Friday night was like you can grow on a Friday night. Yeah, you, you, you know we didn't grow very much. We didn't grow until they put us on Tuesday nights in the Who's the Boss slot on ABC. Right, and they did that in summer reruns, and then by the fall, we carried those numbers back. People had seen us, and they and we brought them all but, to Friday. But 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 I remember you started on this Friday night yeah. thing. Which I just remember thinking, God, this is. I I think it was you or Bob or someone thought this sucks that we're, we're that we're. On we Friday. thought we got buried on Friday. Yeah, and yeah. I thought no, you you know that one of the things about television because I remember Seinfeld had, had had a similar kind of thing. It's sometimes it's good to. Well, you can kind of you can kind of experiment a little bit with you know what the show will eventually become. Bruce you know? Bruce um, Paltrow. Direct, who directed my show, said to me, uh, you which, know, which show? Mind of the Married Man. Mind of the Married Man. He said to me. It's a great show. Yeah, thanks. He, and Bob directed it too. Mm -hmm. he, he said, takes 20 episodes to find a show. Yeah. And a lot of shows don't get 20 episodes right, is the right. problem. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that first season we had 22. And uh, we weren't sure if we were getting the back nine. You know, we were at 13. But Jeff Franklin, Tom Miller, and Bob Boyette, you know, they were working behind the scenes to to get us to, you know, to get ABC to keep us there, you know. Because we really didn't figure out what the show was until about halfway through the first season. And then uh, Tom, Bob, and Jeff pulled us into a room and they said, this is a family show. Because it was originally, like you said, it was three men and a baby, you know, it was three guys raising three little girls. And then they kind of gave us an operating system once they told us that that it wasn't three guys on dates and then they'd go and raise the girls. It was three guys raising these three little girls. And that's when, in our heads, we all kind of had the same operating system to, to move forward with, you know? Um, yeah. You were also on Full House, and I can't remember what season it was. You came on as a guest star with Bruce Baum, and I yeah. remember we were playing cards in the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. And Bob came up to one of you guys, his character, Danny, comes up to one of your characters, you're smoking a cigar, and you, sir, are a chimney. Yeah. It, it was such a funny line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We talk about Bob, you know, with, with such reverence now, you know, but do you remember what he was like on, on the Full House set? He was a pain in the butt. He was a pain in the butt sometimes. But he was a pain in the butt 
in life. In, in life, man. <laughs> we talk about it when he was a man. lovable Stan pain in the butt. and I talk about that because <clears throat> because part of me wants to die so you guys think I'm such a good guy, <laughs> you know. Because Bob was just a pain in the butt, but you we couldn't be a pain in the butt. We adored him, you well, know. We just didn't realize how much we adored him because we miss him now. You oh, know, I know. I I miss him every single day, especially doing this show. I think about him. all I dream about the time. Him. I have time. these dreams about him. You know, that's a different show. Mike. Yeah, that's, that's not, a different. That is not but, Full House Rewind. But but I I remember coming to visit the show. Like I'd be in your dressing room and Stamos would come in to your dressing room. We got to talk to Bob. We got to talk to Bob. We got, and then they bring Jeff in here. We got to talk to Bob. And well, then, so then, and then I, I'd call you later and go, yeah, we talked to Bob. He was right. He, he understood, <laughs> you know. Well, cause he would obsess about a joke or he, you know, and it was just because he, he wanted to do such a great job. He wanted his character to be funny and, you know, it, because he cared, but but he would make it, he would bring everybody into his circle to worry about it with him. But by know? the way, years later, he directed my show. And it was hysterical what a pain in the ass he was. But he did a great <laughs> job. Yeah. And, I, and I loved having him around. Yeah. But he drove me crazy. Yeah, yeah. he, he drove, drove us all crazy. He drove me nuts. And he would call me late at night about stuff and go, Bob, you know, if you were calling me about <laughs> the script or the sets, you're calling me, hey, do you think that girl on the show likes me? I go, Bob, I got to memorize lines. Yeah, every girl lines. on the show was in love with her. I got to memorize yeah. lines. I got to do this. And this is what you're calling me about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, w the way we shot My and the Married Man, we would shoot all this. There was 10 episodes, but we would shoot all this stuff. And then we would go to Chicago with and do all the Chicago stuff. Right, right. And a lot of the directors would just go, you know, there's there's four scenes in Chicago from my episode. Just you Mike, you can shoot it for me. Right. right? And but Bob was like, no, I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. And <laughs> and there'd be like this big crane shot. <laughs> and so I'd go, I'd go, hey Bob, I moved the crane shot. He'd go, and then at lunch, after lunch, he moved it back. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, why'd you move the crane back? So, so years later, he'd go, yeah. you moved my crane shot. Oh, he would retain stuff that, you know, hurt his feelings forever, <laughs> you know? he the, the thing about Bob that would drive me nuts is he would call me, and then uh, I'd start talking. He goes, I, I, I really can't talk. And I go, you called me. Yeah, I know, I know. What, you got to go now? Like, <laughs> he's, I'm so busy. He was always busier than any human being on the planet. My favorite too. thing about Bob is it, it has to do with, like, that answering phone thing yeah back in the old days you would have tapes yeah for your answering machine and bob would call and he would go on and on and on yeah. and he would just go on and on and leave like a 45 minute <laughs> ramble and then he'd go oh by the way you we have to meet we're everyone's meeting at 2 30 at 4 17 jelco avenue at the end <laughs> And yeah. I'd say, Bob, if you're going to do a 45 minute ramble, <laughs> right? Leave the important stuff at the beginning, because I'm and because yeah. I got to go. He was, he was the only guy that would do a set on your answering and, machine. <laughs> and I swear, I just I told my wife, I wish I'd saved all those tapes. I have them. But, uh, I have. But I, I wish have messages. you, you, you would leave. Sh I wish I have some of yours. You would leave <laughs> stuff that would make me laugh. So you would do voices and stuff. <laughs> We had a good time. I'll I had this you. one I, I regret. George Carlin left me a voice machine a message on my thing one night. It blew my mind. He was my childhood hero. Yeah. And he, he came back from a movie that I was in. And he just, he goes, I'm just Called leaving. You? He, he yeah. just said, I just, you know, you were so good in that movie. And I just wanted you to know, man. And he just went on and on and on. And that's all, man. Just George. Just saying. Wow. You don't got to call me back. It's just George saying. I'm proud of you, Mike Binder. Wow. And I, some part of me didn't think, okay, I better save that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I want, I, there's so much stuff I wish I would have saved. I, when Gary Shanling was opening for Joan Rivers, I wrote Joan uh, a joke and she paid me $75. And I talked to Melissa Rivers about this at Bob's Memorial. And uh, the joke was, uh, I said, Gary, here's a joke Joan can do on The Tonight Show. What's the joke, Dave? And I said, 
you know you're getting older when your bra size is a 36 long. <laughs> and she did the joke on The Tonight Show and wrote me a check for $75. And I cashed the check because I needed the money. Oh, man. I yeah. wish I would have kept that check from Joan Rivers. Well, but, but oh, that's right. <clears throat> she gets the return checks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I told M Melissa Rivers at Bob's memorial that she goes, you know, I remember that joke. My mom kept joke cards. She goes, why don't I send you that joke card? So, Melissa, if you're watching this, still waiting on my joke card, okay? Yeah. yeah. That, um, we, we but, but, boy, boy, I'll tell you, uh, you don't remember this, but we went out to dinner with them in Detroit. With Joan and Melissa Rivers? No, Joan oh. and Gary Shandling. We did? Yep. Oh, my gosh. We went out to dinner. With, Gary was opening for her. How can I not remember that? Yeah, I know. I don't know. Jeez. Uh, Joan and... And Gary, were they doing pine knob they or something? Doing pine they were knob. doing pine knob. They okay. were doing pine yeah. knob, and we went out. We went there, and then we went to dinner with them. At, this is when the, there was a Palm Steakhouse. Wow! In Detroit, and we wow. went out to dinner with, with them afterwards. How can I not remember that? I know, isn't that funny? Wow! Pine knob. I remember going to concerts there when I was a kid, and I thought, man, it would be so cool to play this place. And I ended up playing there three times. Yeah. Do you know who I opened so for there? Who'd you open for? Miles Davis. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that crazy? Wow. That is crazy. When I was 19 years old. That's crazy. I did a show with Saget. I did one with Dennis Miller and one with uh, Louis Anderson. Wow. And the one that I did with uh, Dennis, I walked off stage that night and didn't do stand-up for about six, six or seven years. Why? Uh, I was doing Full House. I was doing hosting America's Funniest People, both on ABC. I was doing the Muppet Babies cartoon, and I was doing the real Ghostbusters cartoon. And I was, you know, I was trying to make hay while the sun shines. Like, you know, let's, you're not going to, this isn't going to last forever. So I, uh, I was out doing stand-up, and I was just burned out because I was flying back and forth doing Full House and America's Funniest People in Florida, in Orlando. So I would finish Full House on Friday night, I'd get on a plane, fly to Florida, shoot two episodes of America's Funniest People, and then fly back for Full House on Monday. So I was burnt. I was just burned out. So I was up on stage at Pine Knob. I'm opening the show. Me and Dennis Miller are co-headlining. And I was on stage, and I started going into autopilot where I'm listening to myself tell the jokes, but I'm commenting in my head like, you're not into this, are you? You are not. You were, and then I started talking to myself during my set and I caught myself and I thought, ooh, you were just not present here in front of all these people, in front of 8,000 people or whatever. This is not good. You are not, you know, you're not present and uh, you got to stop. So I, I walked off stage. I watched Dennis's set and then I called Brad Gray and I said, uh, cancel my dates. I'm burned out. I'm just burned out. Kind of scared me, actually, because I'd never really experienced that before in front of 8,000 people laughing, and I'm having this internal dialogue. Well, and you I just were thought, doing a lot at that time. I was man. doing a lot. You're, my yeah. favorite, favorite Full House memory is, which is really kind of, it shows, tells you kind of, you guys were all so close. Yeah. I'd, I'd never seen any group of people get so close. Yeah. We were. And your son, Luke, was such a great little kid. And I lived just down the street from you at this, at yeah, this time. Yeah. When Luke was just a little boy. Santa Monica. Yeah. yeah he, I lived maybe five blocks away, but I was yeah. over the house all the time oh, yeah. with my kids. And but Luke Our kids was, used to trick or treat together. Luke was probably five, yeah. six years old. Yeah. And I remember we were sitting there with a couple of the cast members watching an episode of Full House with the little girls. And I remember Luke turns to you and goes, where's Luke? Right, right. He was watching the television. Yeah. And the little girls were there, and there was a couple other little kids. And he just turned, he thought, and it, this was also a time when the, you guys were taking a lot of home movies. Yeah, he could And video, and he yeah. couldn't tell the difference between, between the, the home two. home videos and, and he just and went, show. where's Luke? Well, because he was with Mary-Kate and Ashley of and course. DJ. So he, I mean, he was I mean, with no. John Stamos yes. and, and Cameron D Can, and Cameron Can, Bur Candace, Candace, Candace and Jody Sweet. And, and, and he was with all, all kids, those people yeah. all the time and all those little girls yeah. and, and Bob and you. And he just thought, okay, yeah. that's another home video. He thought, where am I in this episode? And he turned around <laughs> 
were Where's there Luke? on the couch. Yeah. And he was so confused. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And I, I thought, that. this is such an interesting juxtaposition. And only would happen in this moment in time when people are taking these home videos. Yeah. And with a, with a guy on a show that is so close to all the actors. You were with me when my son was born at Santa Monica Hospital. Yeah, that's Remember right. Remember that? That's right. You were there. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was standing yeah. there and <laughs> you were with me and you're like, hey, you have a son. You that's were right, right there. That's right. That that time. Um, Luke says hi, by the way. I talked to him yesterday, my son Luke. Uh, he's a FedEx pilot. So he was, was here in Los Angeles real briefly and uh, wanted to come out to the set, but he has flight to Memphis today. But he says... He says, who do you got on the show? And I said, well, Mike Binder. He's, oh, I love Mike. Tell Mike hi. So Luke Luke yeah, says Luke, hi. He's always so sweet. I still have that him. one picture when you had that car that Geisler used to call yeah, it. Yeah, the little the little, red, little red car. With him in I, the cup car, yeah. Yeah, I still have that. One of my one of my favorite I, my I favorite always pictures. I always love with, when thinking about Luke as a pilot because he had no choice. You know, he was either <laughs> going to be a pilot or a hockey player. <laughs> Because his well, I used to his take room. him flying. I know. Yeah. Well, not only did you take him flying, but his room was just thousands of airplanes <laughs> and and just everything was hockey. You yeah. Know? yeah. So it was like, you know. And he became a pilot and he plays hockey yeah. still a couple yeah. days a week. Yeah. yeah it's he pretty, was such pretty a great kid. Yeah, but Nick, that moment, that yeah. moment when he turned around, yeah. I thought, man, this is, this is surreal. Yeah. Well, we live right down the block. You used to call me uh, Norton. Yeah. And I used to call you Cramden. Yeah. I don't know how we... Because was we, it Diane? Was, did well, Diane? because we would just walk into each other's houses. Right, like yeah. Cramden and Norton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How are you doing now, Ralphie boy? Yeah, huh? yeah. Yeah, Trixie, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and your son, Bert, he's uh, kind of following in your footsteps, yeah, right? He just, he's, he's directing. Just made a movie. And, he just made a movie that he just won uh, Best Independent Fiction, Picture at the Los Angeles Film Festival. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it's really. He's great. such a good kid. Yeah, he's he just is. always. He's just such a. Yeah. He's a really sweet kid. Yeah. What have you given him any advice? I mean, like that he's you know following in your footsteps or anything you've like said to him like yeah. What just, would you? What advice would you give to any young filmmaker? Because today it's a different landscape. Well, you know that's what Bert started making little YouTube films and they were right. funny as heck. Yeah. Heck, you know, and uh, and that's what I would say. If I would say to any anybody. Make start making little films, put yeah. them up on YouTube, edit them on your laptop, and 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 you know, make content. Don't you wish we we would have had you know all those tools available, you know? Or is it okay that we just did it the way we did? Yeah, yeah. You know, we'd record our sets on a little tape recorder. You know, we yeah. Would, you know, you had to shoot film, you know, or video. You had to edit it on in an editing bay yourself, yeah. or know somebody who. Yeah. You know, had beta editing, you know, is 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 different, you know. I don't know. Everything was analog. Yeah, everything's different, but everything's look, I, I love this moment in time. I love our moment in time. I love the moment in time that's coming. Yeah. And, you know, I just uh, I think you you gotta enjoy where you're at, you know. And I I, I personally I love podcasts. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I I just it's really funny when I did that documentary. I started getting into all these podcasts and then I would tell Leno and Letterman, I would be interviewing yeah. them. And Leno was like, yeah, these podcasts, these guys, yeah, why do they bother by They don't make any money on them. And they don't, I go, well, <laughs> they are, they're doing really well. But yeah, but it doesn't help them sell tickets. Well, they're selling out arenas. <laughs> no, they're not buying it. And then I had Letterman and he goes, yeah, I just was on one, this Marin guy and, First time, but I would never know how to find it. <laughs> you know, it's and then I realized our generation it's we, a different. We, we were so ignorant of the new guys coming up. And then I got mad when I first started because a lot of these guys didn't know much about me or, yeah. or what we did. You yeah. know, and they were so ignorant of like everybody except for Leno and Letterman because mm -hmm. they had talk shows they wanted to be on. Right, right, and. It, the generations didn't cry. I, I would interview these comedians and they had no history. They didn't right. care about the history of the comedy right. store or anything. Well, because there's more of an immediate now. You yeah. know, it's immediate gratification. You get your content is all a la carte and it's it's instantaneous. Yeah. You know, for us, 
we had to wait for a show like Full House to come on on Friday night. Yeah. You had to wait for your favorite show, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that was kind of a special thing, you know? Yeah. You couldn't, you couldn't just binge your favorite program and you're done with it. Well, you know? I was just telling you about this. I wrote this review on 85 South on Stand Up World, and it, it wasn't a good review because I, but I like these guys a lot. And I was talking to Jimmy Dore. You know Jimmy Dore? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jimmy Dore said, I I never even heard of him. I feel, and I said, that's how fragmented everything are. 85 South, they fill up arenas. Yeah, it's <laughs> you know? crazy. Yeah. Everything's so fragmented now. Yeah. You know, but, and they have a great podcast. They yeah. really do. And I love podcasts. I mean, you know, I, I just, to me, I, and I, Jimmy Dore has a great podcast, you know, and, I, Dana and David. And and you're doing uh, something that I think is pretty pretty cool. Tell our audience about standupworld.com. Well, you're, well, you're doing I, a bunch of you're doing a bunch of stuff with it and you're Yeah. Just get, I I'm not sure how much you can tell us about what's going well, on. Well, you're going to cut it all anyway, so no, why should not, I bother? We're not <laughs> no. nope, nope. Your episode is 4 hours long. Yeah, okay, I'm going to keep you talking. Yeah. I'm going to pull a sagging on you. I'm yeah. just going to keep talking. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Then yeah. people will just forward to it. <laughs> yes. When yes. does he talk about Mary Kate again? <laughs> um, but tell us about Stand Up World because uh, I think it's great. Yeah, no, it's listen. It's about the world of stand up comedy, the past, present, and future, and and uh, it's it's you know a stand up blog basically. But yeah. and it's got a newsletter that's just taken off. It's amazing who reads it and and how many people, stand up fans and comedians, and and. I've been doing it for a few years now and I write these articles and but now we're actually I'm turning it into an app that we're building now that is really doing with some pretty incredible people. And I have a podcast that is just me talking and about right. the because so many guys do their own specials now. Yeah. So I I really write about specials. Yeah. And um I I've been my podcast has just been me talking alone, but I'm I want to turn it into me with a bunch of comedians. Yeah, yeah. talking like a round table. Yeah, and having yeah. fun, you know. Cool. And um, but but what we're building is an app. We want it to make it the Spotify of stand-up comedy that really helps comedians make money with these specials right. that because they're not making any money on them. Even when they do it for Netflix now, they make much less than they ever did. Right. And they get they get them right back after a year. Right. But there's no real way to monetize it, so we're building this subscription service, and it's it's really we're doing it with with some great comedians, and we're doing it we're we're building it like an ass cap kind of thing, and where everybody really can monetize, the, and, and if you get you get a piece of what you what you what you earn, yeah. and and um, there's just so many great specials being made. It's kind of like when what the music industry, what happened yeah. there, you know, it's happening with with stand up comedy. Buddy Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I love you, Dave. I love you too. I'm so um, glad. But you know, yeah. you're not getting away that easy. We get to do one more thing before we say goodbye because it's time for ah, uh, cut it out. Aww. Cut it out. Of course, every episode of Full House had a heartfelt scene, and we have cut out a scene from episode five that we're gonna read together, you and me. Okay. Okay. So you got your script, and you're going to be reading the role of uh, of Joey, okay? I'm going to be Danny and Jesse, so you get to be me. Okay. All right. And action. Danny, you knew the dragons would destroy the village. <laughs> Where is oh, that? Oh, is it, uh, this, is, this is from Game of Thrones. Oh. <laughs> Wrong script. That's okay. the Game of Thrones okay, script. Sorry. Okay, okay, ready, ready and ready, take okay, two. Okay, ready. You are not going to get this roll, <laughs> okay, by the way. Okay. All right, ready and action. Danny, why are you so upset with Caroline? Because she wanted to make dinner. The real problem is you like her. Okay, I do like her, and it, it scares me. Ever since Pam, everything is just so hard and confusing. I know how tough this has been on you. But that's how life is. It's a struggle. But that's what helps you get through the tough times. You get through the tough times with the people by your side. So when people like Roxanne and Carolyn come along, why push them away just because you're frustrated with your career and because you're not ready to date yet? You're throwing away what could be great friendships. Is this the same guy who spends hours perfecting underarm noises? 
Where is this coming from? From my heart. I did have some help with the words. It's what Scooby-Doo told Scrappy-Doo last Saturday morning. <laughs> Thanks, Joey. Come here, you big goof. All right. We got in some male bonding after all. Boy, that always brings a tear to my eye. A big round of applause and a thank you to my buddy, Mike Binder. It's great having Mike Binder here for episode five. I still think it was a bit weird, though, that Danny, Jesse, and Joey started singing Rockin' Robin on a boat. Full House videos seem to be everywhere you look on the internet. And we like to bring them to you on Full House. and Bob. I love them dearly, but boy, could they be immature. <laughs> if you got a Full House video you'd like to send us, we'd love to hear from you. Send us a link to your video at fullhouserewind at podcode.us. Oh, somebody's here. Hey, Dave. Hey, look, it's my buddy, Mr. Woodchuck. Dave, it was great seeing your buddy, Mike Binder. Yeah, he's pretty great. You two were roommates. Yeah, we were. And you lived in West Ward. <laughs> Bye, Dave. Oh, boy. Mr. Woodchuck, always joking around. But you know what? He's got a special place on our show, and we love him. And we close every episode of Full House Rewind by giving all of you who need it a hug. So here it is, your Full House hug. Come on, bring it in. Yeah, that's better. That's our show. We'd like to thank Mike Binder for stopping by and thank you for listening and watching because you are the heart and soul of Full House Rewind. Now, go out there, share the love. So long. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Full House Rewind. To watch clips from the pod, go check out the Full House Rewind Clips YouTube channel at the link in the description. And we'll see you next week.